everybody this is the second segment of the uh, Precambrian chapter uh, and now we are at the end of the Hadean and we're going to start talking about the geologic history. We have two Precambrian eons and the older one is the Archean and the younger one is the Proterozoic. These divisions are still uh, geochronologic because we, we only have absolute age data. We do not have anything else because because there are no fossils and there are no stratotypes. They are extremely metamorphosed, um, psychometamorphosis, metamorphism after metamorphism happened to them. So there is no way for doing any kind of uh, stratigraphic anal analysis like we do on the, on the present day rocks. So it's quite impossible. So let's jump into the Archean. And I kind of already told you that the composition of the earliest crust must have been uh, ultramafic, mafic, and it formed by the partial melting of the mantle and uh, crystallization on the surface. Uh, partial melting of the earliest basaltic ultramafic crust along subduction zones could have produced andesitic island arcs. And uh, partial melting of the andesite could have resulted in the granite, granitic magma. The granitic magma, or I also could say felsic magma, is um, is more rich in silica. It's more than 65% of SiO2, and uh, those those melts are containing a lot of much more complicated silicate structure than the ultramafic uh, composition. Each present-day continent uh, actually has a so-called Precambrian shield, and this is consisting of the exposed ancient rocks. Um, if you go outward from the shield, you will find the so-called platform area, which is underlined by Precambrian rocks, and it's actually covered by Paleozoic sediments. Now, the shield and the platform together is what we call crater. And you have to know this because I'm going to ask this on the, on the midterm, so you should know crater. Shields and platform together are called craton. Uh, the cratons are relatively stable. They, they are stable since the beginning of the Phanerozoic, so they have been stable at least for 540 million years. And these guys are the immobile part of the continents, and they form the basis uh, on top of which the, the Phanerozoic sediments were deposited. Uh, and this here is a map showing the, the shields of each continent. As you can see, every single one of them has, even Antarctica right here, big Precambrian shield. So look at it, it's all. The, the, the dark brown is the exposed and the light brown is the one which actually is covered by younger sediment. And this picture here shows the, the uh, North America, like our continent. And you can clearly see that the, the green area is the shield right here in Canada, mostly in Canada. We don't have shield down in, in um, North America. I mean, I shouldn't say North America, the USA. Uh, and the brown is platform, which means it's underlined with this Precambrian sediment. And then you got the so-called mobile belts. Those are the the active orogenic regions like the Appalachian and the and the Cordilleros, as you know. Uh, so these are Phanerozoic or orogenic belts. So we're going to talk about that uh, throughout the end of the semester now. And this one is a close up of the Canadian Shield. All the red areas are exposed ancient rocks, um, and it includes most most of Canada, but as you can see, there is a big chunk of um, Greenland, which belongs to this um, Canadian shield, basically. Uh, sometimes, the, actually, these rocks are exposed. Sometimes they have glacial sediments on top of them, but that's it. And this picture is really actually showing you northern Canada with this amazing uh, metamorphic rocks which are exposed on the beach. I mean, this is really something to see. And I have not been there, so I, I, it's still on my bucket list. Before I die, I really want to go see this. 
and that's another picture of of um, of this Canadian shield. Uh, the interesting fact is that we are actually pretty lucky because there are some outcropping Precambrian rocks in other parts of North America too and you can see that one of them is right here in Virginia and I mean I should say the eastern United States but we have a good chunk of it too. The other areas where it's exposed is in the in the Rocky Mountains, we have it in the Grand Canyon, the back hills of South Dakota and these are um, outcrop because of erosion so they have been covered with uh, phanerozoic sediments but then the sediment uh, weathered away so now they are outcropping and uh, I have a map here which shows you the locations of, of the Precambrian rocks in Virginia so you can see the Blue Ridge is mostly Precambrian rocks and it's time for you to start memorizing the, the geology of Virginia. It's going to be very important in your, on your final. And you know the physiographic provinces of Virginia. I just put a, a lab up about this. So you will have to start working on this. And it's going to culminate in the final where you have to write a whole page about the geology of Virginia. I, I'll talk to you about it more. The other area where we have Precambrian rocks is in the Piedmont right here. We have two main rock types in the Archean rock assembly, the so-called greenstone belts and the granite nice complexes and they occur right everywhere. And this just shows you the cross section of the greenstone belts. They are typically formed in belts which have synclinal form, you know syncline is which down arching pole that's the syncline so that's the form they have and they have a sequential transition from from ultramafic volcanics at the bottom to phasic volcanics and it's cut by sediments so phasic volcanics and cut by sediments uh, it is very important that these guys have ultramafic volcanoes I mean ultramafic rocks of ultramafic ultramafic rocks which are volcanic in origin that's how I should have said it uh, to have ultramafic volcanoes the surface the lava temperature has to be at least 1600 degrees Celsius which you don't have anymore so we don't ever there is no uh, ultramafic volcanoes anymore the the most mafic volcanoes are, are basaltic mafic not ultramafic so we know that the the mantle temperature was much much higher than it is today uh, we do have a lot of pillow lava and remember what is the pillow lava means it means that the lava came out underwater and then we do have sedimentary rocks uh, but these guys are mostly gray rockies which means that they are very very immature and um so-called dirty sense and that means that they have every kind of particles in there um, there is some conglomerates too right there and this just a picture of a pillow lava um, at least how it looks in the in the greenstone bed but you can clearly see the the pillow shape um, basalt right here so you know that these lavas come actually under water so by the time these form there was water for sure okay so this is the pillow basalt and as I told you uh, we did have ultramafic lava at this time and these are the rocks which are called comatites comatites right here that's the word and these are uh, cooled from ultramafic lava flows and it's it's less than 35 or 45 percent silica and uh, the near surface temperature must have been at least 1600 degrees Celsius so they are about 250 degrees hotter than the hottest magma we know today know of today so that's the comati comati tides comati Comatites, however, I don't know exactly how to pronounce it, but this is the word right there, 
common types, common types, I think. Now, how these rocks must have formed? Uh, there is tectonic evolution model for these rocks, and most likely, scientists believe that it could have formed in two ways. One is the reef basin model, and the other one is the oceanic oceanic uh, convergent plate boundary model. And it's logical because the gray rock is a very, very mature sedimentary rock. So if you are in the reef basin, remember that's a gray burn and the sediment is coming from the mountains. And if it's a back arc basin, that, then the sediment is still coming from the volcano. So it's really hard to, to separate those two actually, especially when you didn't have anything but just the same kind of volcano. So, so both model is explainable really. Uh, the end of the Archean is actually represented by the so-called Canoran orogeny. And uh, to understand how unsure all this uh, boundary putting is, that, that uh, scientists say that it's 2.7 and 2.5 billion. That's the boundary. The, the boundary is, is between 2.5 and 2.7 billion years ago. So if you, if you understand what that means, that, that the un, um, the scientists are really not sure about that because a boundary is 200 million. It's half of the Fenerozoic uh, in duration. Just think about it. It's crazy. Uh, but we do believe that by the end of the, the Canoran orogeny, the core of North America was assembled uh, by continent, continent collisions. So it's 2.5 billion years ago. That means that it has been two, almost like one and a half billion years. So if you divide it by like 350, so it's about six complete uh, plate tectonic, um, I mean, Wilson cycles. So um, there is logic behind it that North America has to be like a sizable continent by the end of the Canoran orogeny. So, what do we know about the plate tectonics during the Archean? Uh, because of the presence of the comotite, which, remember, the only way that it would form that the surface temperature must be at least 1600 degrees Celsius, that, that actually tells us that the, the plate tectonics had to be faster than it is today. The temperature was much higher, so therefore they, they had to work faster. So because of the convent convection cell had to be much more vigorous than it is today. Uh, so therefore, we had faster uh, plate motion and that would cause more collision. So therefore, the Wilson cycle might have been also faster during this time. What do we know about the atmosphere? Um, we know that originally Earth didn't have major atmosphere. There might have been some hydrogen and helium present, but definitely it evaporated because the sun wasn't too far away, so it evaporated. It's very light, so it can evaporate very easily. And as soon as the differentiation happened, the, the magnetic field got established, and from that moment on, whatever gas formed inside the magnetic field is, is actually got sticked around the Earth because the magnetic field doesn't let the atmosphere go away. So the most important um, role of the magnetic field is that, that it keeps the Earth's atmosphere around the Earth. Um, so if you think about what kind of gases could be in the atmosphere if it has to come from inside the Earth. The only way gases getting out of the Earth is the, is the volcanic gases. So we say that our atmosphere originally have formed by the so-called outgassing. And the composition of the first, I mean the second basically, if the hydrogen and helium went away, the, the, form, the composition of the Earth atmosphere at this time must have been everything which comes out of the volcano. So CO2, water vapor, SO2, hydrochloric acid, carbon monoxide, hydrogen, nitrogen, and there was ammonia. There was every, every element which life needs 
have been present in the volcanic gases, so that's kind of important to know. So we have the outgassing, and that is how the atmosphere formed from within the Earth. Now, one of the gases which I didn't um, list here was oxygen. So, therefore, we know that the earliest atmosphere have had definitely oxygen deficit. And if, if you suppose that there was no oxygen, like free oxygen present uh, plentifully, then you would have uh, some evidence for that. And that's uh, exactly what we have. Uh, the detrital deposit, meaning the sedimentary rocks, have uh, a lot of pyrite in them. And pyrite clearly forms in environments when there is no oxygen, such as the coal, remember? And uh, the other thing which you might have not known, that there is the uranium, uranium mineral, mineral the uraninite, which strictly form in oxygen defic deficit environment, because normally uranium would be U04. And it's an oxygen rich environment. But in this case, it's not. So these are uh, quickly, these are the evidences that actually the, the early atmosphere was oxygen deficit. And the other reason that we know that it was that way is that we have no iron present in oxidized form at all. Uh, because there was no oxygen in the atmosphere, uh, we didn't have ozone layer to protect life as we know it today. So the only way for life, life to form was in the ocean. How did the ocean form? So that's quite easy because as soon as the earth cooled down enough, that the water become liquid, the formation of ocean started. And uh, a lot of the Archean rocks show evidence that they were deposited in, in water, such as the pillow lava, and we have extensive sedimentary rocks, uh, which shows evidence that they were being deposited in water. So we know that there was water, but we also know that the, the presence of water was very, very different than uh, today. Archean rocks show no evidence of shallow water platforms like the continental shelf, uh, and there was no well-developed continental water system either, so we do not have any evidence for that. And finally, uh, this is the time to start talking about the origin of life, and I guess I'm just gonna start a new segment for that, so that's gonna be segment three. and. So bye for now.